complicated and non-prescriptive. From the euro to environment to uh, the use of energy, how to stop wars and famines. We're competing over resources. We're competing over who writes the rules for the global economy. But at the same time, we have a world of hyper-interdependence. The future of one country is completely linked to the future of the next. The problem is that we have an architecture of power which corresponds to the economic architecture of the 1970s. Science, technology, the market and economics are globalised. Politics are not. No one seems to have, not even the superpowers, the power that is needed to tackle the problems that the world is facing. The issues are across borders, with each other, so it's a huge enterprise. Governments can't keep pace and things change just so quickly. The danger is that some of those challenges become very immediate and, and very, very problematic indeed. What are the new sorts of models that we can think about that will allow for the provision of public goods going forward? We need to think holistically. Get a more global perspective on problems and get a perspective from different points of view, from the private sector, from government, from academics, from think tanks and activists. Business, science and technology, media, they all have a seat at the table when decisions are deliberated on. It comes down to collaboration. There's no one company, no one country, no one NGO or university that has all the answers. Be inclusive of many perspectives. That have both the depth to deal with the technical issues and the breadth to deal with all the linkages across the world. And if we don't try to tackle them in this multi-stakeholder approach, it's going to be very difficult to solve them. Constructive collaboration across knowledge boundaries and subject areas is what makes this network unique. We know what the world's most pressing challenges are. We have the opportunity to jointly shape the global agenda. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Nick Gowing, and it's great to see a thousand of you uh, here in this room, but this is not going to be the way of the next two days. This session is really a bridge to informality and intense conversation to raise that issue right at the beginning. What is the new international context, and what are the future implications for global governance? Remember, this is a big conversation. Uh, and um, I would like you to try and get to the heart of some of these challenges of global governance, what it's doing and what it is not doing at the moment. At this time, I might be saying, switch off your iPhone, switch off your Samsung, switch off your Galaxy, switch off your iPad. I'm saying, keep it on but keep it on mute because I'd like you to feel that you are part of this conversation even though there are a thousand of you in here by contributing to the live social media feed which I will try and inject into the discussion over the next hour. Don't give me a hard time if your voice isn't heard or your, uh, your view isn't raised but I want to try and get as many ideas and thoughts into the mix as possible. There is uh, a live feed which is now moving through and this is not just for this session it's for the conversations in your agenda councils and also uh, between now and Wednesday when we all disperse. So think of it, please, in those terms. Um, I'd like you to engage now if you can. Send me whatever ideas you have. I've already got several which have come through, particularly focusing on youth and the challenges of unemployment, uh, on the global governance of institutions at the moment. So there's plenty already coming through and we're going to try and categorize them as well. But let's hear first from the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, with some opening thoughts to stimulate this discussion. Thank you, Nick, and uh, let's be very straightforward. Um, we have no global governance system today. What we have today is a multilateral system which is no longer able to address the challenges of the 21st century. Let me, as a kind of uh, positive contribution, just outline some of the criteria how probably an optimal 
global governance system should look like, and we will see how far away we still are from such a system. First, a global system for the 21st century must be multi-stakeholder placed. Governments alone, business alone, civil society alone cannot address the issues on the global agenda effectively. Second, a global system should be systemic and not fragmented, departmentalized as it is now, because all the issues are interrelated, and I think you, the Global Agenda Councils, are a great demonstration of this interrelationship. Third, it should be strategic and not crisis-driven. What we see today in the world is that 99% of the energy is absorbed by the management of crisis instead of thinking about the future. Fourth, such systems should be agile, which means we have to permanently test and upgrade the parameters and the assumptions of the decision-making because the world is, and the context is changing so fast. Fifth, it has to be inclusive but effective. So how do we find the optimal mix between the G20 and the United Nations? Six, it has to continuously demonstrate legitimacy. And today, in the world of today, legitimacy is not only shown by uh, democratic principles, but it's also demonstrated by clear, measurable objectives, transparency, and showing results. Seventh, such a system has to make sure that actions follow decisions. Just look at the G20 decisions, um, and I'm excluding um, uh, Gordon when you were uh, in the chair, but uh, just look at all the decisions and what has been realized today. We have clearly in the world a delivery problem. And since we have a delivery problem, since prom actions do not follow promises, we also have a trust issue because people do not trust the system anymore. X, we have to develop a global consciousness and constituency. Too often, leaders emphasize national interests as being superior to global interests, even if the contrary is the case. Nine, to be credible and sustainable, it's such a system has to be based on a common moral framework. And here, of course, I refer to the fundamental in the presence of um, the Deputy UN Secretary General, uh, to the fundamental, um, to the uh, human rights declaration. But probably we need today also a, um, a human duties declaration. Um, and finally, such a system has to be visionary, long term, but we need, we cannot implement the vision immediately. So we need very pragmatic steps in order to close the gap between the vision and where we stand now. Now, the Global Agenda Councils here in the room are clearly, in my op opinion, embedded into the philosophy I just outlined. And I think we are now all very curious to hear from three experienced leaders how we can finally install a global governance system which deserves its name in the 21st century. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me just give you the email and Twitter address so that you know where to send your messages. I hope it goes up there. But while it's appearing, um, let me give you an idea of the kind of messages I'm getting already, particularly on youth. What do you believe are the biggest issues facing global youth, and how is uh, the global agenda engaging with these issues and young people? 17%, another one, 17% of the world's population are young people, 15 to 24, but 40% of the world's unemployed are youth. What are we going to do? And one just in from Roger Chisnell. What will you do to end huge 
inequality, debt, reckless lenders protected from market forces, bank bailouts. Those are the kind of messages I'm already getting. But let's build forward with the concepts certainly coming from the three experts on, on the, uh, the panel at the moment. And please keep those coming through now. Don't leave it until one minute, until three o'clock, because it won't get heard. Gordon Brown, currently Special UN Envoy uh, for Global Education, uh, and of course Britain's former Prime Minister. You have five minutes, Gordon. John F. Kennedy said 50 years ago this year that America should complement its declaration of independence with a declaration of interdependence. And I think all of us here could be, if you like, a 1,000 people pressure group for the global cooperation that Klaus Schwab has so eloquently described is necessary. Cooperation not just between governments, but involving foundations, companies, uh, ph philanthropic organizations, and of course, many pressure groups and interest groups around the world. Why is this necessary? If I take the five issues in economic uh, policy that have got to be dealt with, I think I can explain to you why the absence of international cooperation has become a barrier to the success of each individual country. We know uh, that uh, we have uh, no decoupling of the world economy, and we know that everyone is now affected uh, by a deterioration in the growth prospects around the world. We know that a financial crisis in any country can affect almost every country, and we know that we have yet to build the rules, the standards, the underpinning of a global financial system. We know that the failure to create a climate change framework at Copenhagen is meaning that renewables investment, which many of the companies here are interested in, is not happening in the way we want it to do. Pascal Lamy, who's done an excellent job, will explain to you why, for the first time in 40 years, it has been difficult to get a world trade agreement. And we know also, and there are many people here concerned about this, that the Millennium Development Goals are within our grasp, but at the moment we've got very little chance of achieving them. Now, why has international cooperation in this interdependent world uh, waned rather than risen as a result of the financial crisis? We can blame uh, leaders, and uh, uh, most people do, uh, and uh, it's said of uh, finance ministers, there's only two kinds of finance ministers, and I was one of them, there's only two kinds of finance ministers, those who fail and those who get out just in time. So <laughs> we can blame the leaders. We, we can understand that there is a protectionist sentiment, uh, and that is true when there is a crisis in any individual country that people tend to retreat. I remember being chairman of the IMF and being at a meeting in Washington where there was a poster outside the meeting, worldwide campaign against globalization. And you know again what people meant, this protectionist sentiment that has grown as a result of the crisis. Uh, we can blame the lack of coordination in the international system and say we have not seized the opportunities that the G20 created, that is created by uh, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, and many other organizations. But I think we're coming to the conclusion uh, that this is the problem. The world is changing incredibly fast. It is no longer possible for one economy, one country, to drive the world economy forward. Ten years ago, America could have uh, resurrected growth in the world economy on its own. Ten years from now, perhaps Asia could resurrect the world economy by pushing forward as its middle class grows in great numbers. At the moment, we're in a transition stage where the majority of production is in one part of the world and the majority of consumption is in another part of the world. And if you think of uh, the relationship between the producer and the consumer, there has always got to be confidence between the two. And so in this transition stage, it is even more vital that there is cooperation between the economies of the world. I would suggest, first of all, that we uh, protest, all of us, about the need for global cooperation. I would say that we will not return to the growth levels we want to return to unless it happens. China's got to consume more. Europe and America have got to invest more in infrastructure in the context of fiscal sustainability. India's got to open up and we've got to help them do so. It is possible to have a global growth agreement and the IMF calculated that you could create 25 to 50 million jobs if you did that. We need, however, also to reform the international institutions. The IMF should be uh, more like a central bank for surveillance. 
Uh, the uh, G20 should broaden its uh, remit to include other countries in its consultations and have a far more professional secretariat. There should be a far closer link between the uh, UN and the G20 as well as with the international organisations. It is possible to envisage us moving forward with global cooperation if people decided that this was essential. And I would put it to you that the next time a financial crisis happens in the world, and there will be other financial crises, it could come out of Asia, it could come out of Europe, it could come out of America, people will ask, why did we not learn the lesson that there had to be greater international cooperation in dealing with these problems? I suggest that in the next two days, all of you, in the individual groups you are involved in, can put the case that not only <coughs> need there be changes in national policies, but there need be changes in the way we cooperate globally, and there are obvious mechanisms for moving that forward. John F. Kennedy also said that those people who build the, the, the present in the image of the past miss out entirely on the challenges of the future. I believe that you are the audience that will shape uh, the next uh, future for our world. Thank you very much. Before we move on to Pascal and Jan Eliasson, let me just give you an idea of the kind of issues and thinking that's going on among you, um, particularly this one, Anupam Saraf saying, global governance or common purposes for local governance? Question there. A couple of other uh, comments. Um, Brian Whedon, how do we get those currently in power to allow creation of a multi-stakeholder governance system which lessens their power? Uh, let me go to number 48. What are we focused on now that is diverting attention and resources from more important problems? And from Caroline Kendi Robb, uh, number 49, I've got them all listed here by numbers. Hopefully they'll go up there. Youth unemployment is a massive problem in Africa. 10 million young Africans entering the labor market every year. How can global governance institutions address these issues? That reflects several I've already had about youth unemployment, particularly in the developing countries. Pascal, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Nick. Well, I would start from a slightly different diagnosis. Uh, and my own view is that it's not all the system that is clogged and that doesn't work. There is a part of the international system which works, in my view, reasonably well, which is the one that has to do with delivering things, food, roads, medicines, that works. The World Bank works well, UNDP works, UNIDO works. And not only do they work, but they can find the necessary resources. They have the necessary support. So I would not confuse that part of the system, which in my view is working, with another part of the system, which is not about delivering things, uh, but about delivering rules. Now, that part of the system, true, uh, is not working, or let's say not working well, whether it's about you know, macroeconomic coordination, uh, uh, climate change, uh, trade, uh, social standards, uh, prudential standards in the financial industry, true, as compared to the past, the capacity of the international system to provide the necessary global framework, convergences, trade-offs, uh, is in bad shape. Now, why is it so? And that's the point I would like to put in the discussion. Uh, not so much because we don't have the systems. We have the systems. We have the machineries. We have the institutions. I mean, it's far from being perfect. Uh, and the architecture is, let's say, not complete. But we have the basics. What's missing, in my view, for the moment, <coughs> is not so much the, <coughs> sorry, the instruments, the engines of global governance, but the fuel that makes the engine work. And the fuel that makes the engine work is political energy. And the tank for political energy is in governance. The tank for political energy is in the ones who have the legitimacy from the people who are elected 
more or less elected, generally elected governments, who then drive these institutions and provide them with the necessary legitimacy and support. Now, this, in my view, is where we have a serious problem for the moment. Uh, we don't have <clears throat> much political energy left in the tank. And this has to do with the crisis. Uh, most governments have been uh, severely hit in their legitimacy, in their leadership capacity by the crisis, and this is perfectly understandable. Uh, people are angry, there's too much unemployment, there's not enough economic growth. This has created a huge social damage in many countries, which, as could be expected, has deteriorated the legitimacy of governments. They have less political energy. And doing things internationally necessitates a lot of political energy. Because you have to explain to your people uh, that you have to do things which you might not do if you were standing alone, uh, but which you have to do because you have to interact, compromise, find a trade-off with others, which in political terms is something which is sometimes very difficult vis-à-vis -vis domestic constituencies. So my basic point for the moment is that we are in for a period of low international energy, and that will be the case as long as the crisis is there. It's inevitable, and the question is how can we exit this, and how can we find a sort of extra energy? in order uh, to compensate uh, for the one that's missing. And on this, I will conclude just like Gordon did it. I think other places than governments can provide energy for that in the world of today. Huh? Businesses, civil society, trade unions, I mean, groups which have their own legitimacy, less damaged than governments by the crisis, who can represent a sort of more credible hope that there is an exit, I think if those coalize, then we might supplement uh, for this, let's say, government failures. There are market failures, there are government failures, and I think this is one. Thank you, Pascal. <laughs> An idea of the other thoughts in your mind coming to you as you listen to Pascal and Gordon Brown. Ian Bremer from the Eurasia Group. Governance institutions can't be global in this environment. Smaller coalitions of the willing to get through present tensions. Number 51 here. How do we institutionalize discontinuity, including the disenfranchise and regain trust? That from Mohamed Isis. Uh, and moving on to number 54 from Bada Jafar, how does one reconcile the lack of a global framework for, glo for, for corporate governance with that of global governance? Aren't the two inseparable? Um, and a couple more here, uh, particularly one to Gordon Brown, which I saw, uh, which I'll find in a moment. But Juliana Rotic, the role of the citizens, number 56, the role of the citizens does not end with your vote, said President Obama during the re-election speech. How can structures of government allow for participation and true collaboration to deal with the many challenges facing the world today? And of course, Pascal, you'll pick up a lot of these issues as you're chairing the GAC on institutional governance. Jan Eliasson, the floor is yours, picking up some of those issues if you yeah, want. Yeah, well, uh, both uh, the preceding speakers have spoken about the uh, challenge to internationalism. And I think there is a grave risk we have today that international cooperation and globalization is seen more and more as a problem, as a peril, and not as a potential and a possibility. And if the outside world, if international cooperation becomes a problem, we're in for a dark age. And that's why we who are involved in finding international solutions international formulas for solution have such a responsibility. Because we have to produce such good formulas, whether it's climate, migration, or organized crime, we must produce such good solutions and formulas that they are seen as a national interest. In the end, the good international solution 
must be seen as a national interest. And that squares the equation if we are successful, because then we will see the parliaments agreeing with certain international agreements that public opinion would agree and that the editorial writers would agree. Of course, we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. But I have to pick up from your structure, Nick. You wanted us to first give, it just with headlines, the changing international context. And secondly, uh, how we deal with the uh, governance issues, where I, of course, subscribe to the same theory. We have to do it together. And this group is wonderfully representative of the interests that we need to come together. I don't think in my lifetime I've ever seen in the last five years, and during a five-year period, a more drastic geopolitical, geoeconomic, geosocial change. Uh, the drift the, to Asia, of course, in terms of economic power, the emerging powers generally, and I feel it in the United Nations with the unease about the uh, uh, reform of the Security Council from some of these emerging powers, the uh, constant, seems Pascal, economic woes that we are having with very serious effects on not least youth unemployment, a huge problem of, which goes far beyond the economic uh, area, and you have already touched upon that. You have also the uh, enormous changes in communications. Uh, in our lifetime, we have seen uh, an absolute revolution. I myself was in Darfur mediating in the conflict in Darfur and the clan leaders of northern Darfur which were much more skillful in telling Al Jazeera what we had agreed than we did, the negotiators. Uh, and you noticed, of course, the enormous power of uh, information in, in the different movements around the Arab Spring. As to Arab Spring, there is now, I think, another trend that I think we need to uh, think about, and that is the, the way that people rather think about Arab turmoil. And of course, we are all affected by the tragic, horrible developments in Syria. And one of the aspects which is important to, to note here is that that conflict is more and more taking on sectarian, ethnic, and religious dimensions. And if you take on those dimensions, you immediately have a regional conflict of a much more serious character. And I think this polarization that we have seen in this world also, very often in ethnic, religious uh, uh, terms, uh, is another trend which we have to watch for. <clears throat> another thing is the uh, existential threat to our environment. I just come from New York. We went through a natural disaster. And uh, I heard the mayor of New York and the governor of New York talk about climate change. But something has to be done about southern Manhattan being flooded next time, and that the sea level of sea rise, the sea rise level is a real problem. This is new. And then lastly, women. I'm sorry this panel doesn't quite reflect this, but the, the empowerment of women is absolutely crucial. <laughs> More than half of the audience applauded, so this is a good... It's a good sign. Uh, so here, here is the, 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 uh, the uh, environment. The, 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 then the real issue is, here we are, these huge problems, and we can't handle them alone. That's, the, I think, the key for problems of governance. Anyone, no one can deal with the problem alone, whether it's the United Nations, the government, the European Union, or African Union, or business. Or, we all realize that we have to do it together. That's the basic thing, and that's my simple model is that we should put the problem in the center. And I don't mind putting a glass of water in the center. And then ask ourselves, who can do something about it? And then gather those around the table. And that's why the World Economic Forum is such a wonderful idea. And this type of gathering is such a wonderful idea. Because you are here, who can make a difference. If any one of us were trying to do it on our own with our vertical method, the silo method, we would fail miserably. It is only when we mobilize that force together. And then you come to the formula that, again, the good international solution is a national interest, and that we need to bring all actors on board. And that's, I think, what this is all about. And 
I think it's wonderful that you gather around all these precise areas and that we'll realize that if you do it well together, then we in the United Nations would be extremely grateful to receive your recommendations and we would even like to be part of it. UN is sometimes in the lead of a number of issues, but I, I think also we also very much are, are a catalyst, want to be a catalyst for action. And uh, you can be also the Catholic, catalytic force for, for, for us. But I would like to see World Economic Forum as an ally in this common pursuit. Thank you very much. There's a real pressure emerging here, a real concern about the next generation, however you want to define it. Jean-Pierre Lehmann, I agree with the imperative of setting the agenda for the next generations. If youth has no hope in the future, there is no hope for the future. And also there are several of you picking up uh, that uh, issue about global governance or common purposes for local governance. Can I ask you, each of you, to build on that? Because several people are already beginning to pick that up as an issue. Gordon Brown. Yeah, I, I think we're three of us are agreed on, on a number of things. First, first of all, this is bound to be and will become a more interdependent world, and our policies must involve greater international cooperation. Secondly, there are areas where the world can work well and does work well, but I think the five areas that I outlined, Pascal would agree, were not working well, and that's finance, climate change, growth, uh, and uh, financial stability, as well as the Millennium Goals. I think we're also agreed on this, and this comes to this local national point, that unless countries understand that there is a limit to how far they can proceed with success without global cooperation, they will not support it. So unless America understands that its future prospects are dependent on international cooperation and there are certain things that it as a country cannot do on its own, uh, then it will not, as uh, Jeanne said, uh, support the global cooperation I'm talking about. So you've got to look at issue by issue. I'm waiting for the American politician to say, it's the global economy stupid, not just it's the economy stupid, <coughs> it's the global economy stupid. So if you take climate change, huge chance for advance, but we fail to get an international agreement. And by failing to get an international agreement, as I say, we don't have renewables investment at the level we want. Why is there not a more effective business pressure a pressure from the NGOs, a pressure from the foundations to tell the leaders you've got to go back to the table and look at a frame. It may not be a treaty, but a framework for moving forward international cooperation. Young people. Because Sir Saskia Sassen, I found that question. Why not more cooperation with the financial crisis? Could it be that the crisis broke the tissue of cooperation? No, it's the other way around. At the point of the crisis, people were prepared to work together. We had a G20 in London. Uh, we had uh, international cooperation to deal with the worst effects of the crisis. But as we moved out of the crisis, people retreated into the national silos. And no politician gained any credit for saying, this is a global problem and we've got to deal with it by international cooperation. What happened is people said, this is a Greek problem, this is a German problem, this is a Spanish problem. This is a problem of a particular uh, financial system somewhere in the world. And politicians gained more credit for saying, we'll solve this as a national problem than by cooperating globally. So at the moment of crisis, people will come together. When the crisis starts to uh, look as if it is soluble, people retreat into the national silos. So I take a very different view that it was the pressure of the crisis that forced cooperation. But as people have moved from that, the problems have seemed more intractable and less susceptible to the international uh, cooperation that I'm uh, talking about. And I can give you examples with unemployment, which you mentioned about young people, uh, to even emphasise that point, but perhaps I can come back later to do so. Pascal Lamy and, and Jan Eliasson, the issue of uh, common, common purposes for local governance. A couple of other comments which have come through uh, on this uh, from Roger Alter. Collaboration, of course, but how to decide and how to be accountable. Uh, Fred Guterri, what are the prospects for international cooperation and collaboration, he says, on climate change? And Don Tapscott, why are state-based global institutions inadequate for global problem solving and governance? Well, I would, again, take a slightly different view from Gordon, although I agree with his starting point. My experience of the G20 and the crisis is that the crisis has damaged cooperation instead of enhancing it. Now, you're right, Gordon, at some stage, at the beginning, there was a sort of collective agreement to do something. And the collective agreement at the beginning was to spend money, which, frankly speaking, is not the hardest thing to do for politicians. 
they all decided that they would open the tap of budget and central banks, and they did it in a sort of coordinated way, which was fine. But again, uh, not the biggest hurdle in governance, as we all know. Now, there was also a bit of a good resolve at the beginning, for instance, to fill this huge gap on financial regulation, and I think you, uh, Gordon, deserve a bit of a credit for that, because for a British Prime Minister at the time to advocate for regulating the financial industry was a total U-turn as compared to what the British position had been in the previous 20 years. So quite a bit of credit for that, but the truth is that the moment we came to issues that necessitate to overcome domestic reluctances to compromise, energy was not there. Look at Basel and financial regulation, which they still are struggling to get a few things done together, and I'm not speaking about whether or not they will be implemented uh, and what will happen if they're not implemented, which is you know, downstream the governance pipe. So I think it's, it's a slightly different interpretation of what happened and did not happen. Where I totally will agree is that in those circumstances, political pressure comes from the local. Because this, because is, what this is where legitimacy is. Political legitimacy is, will, and has to remain local. And this is a basic principle of power organization, is that power has to be near to the people. And that's, I think, a, a global prerequisite. Now, the question is, how can you translate these global issues into local issues. And I think climate change is a very good one. Trade is another one. At the moment you start realizing that opening trade is uh, creating jobs, then you know that you have to create jobs, and in order to that, you have to overcome a few hurdles that resist trade opening. But as, this as, is a local issue. I think, uh, Pascal, we, I think it's about time that we start to take away the artificial lines between local, national, regional and international global. It's actually the same. Practically all the issues we deal with are relevant on all these levels. Local and global is the same. Global is actually somebody else's local. Global is somebody else's local. And if you take that perspective, you realize that of course it's, it's wrong to always blame the outside world. It's, it's easy. It's, it's, in a democratic environment, it's usually very, unfortunately, very simple. You point to the outside and say, oh, this jobs disappear to this place. Uh, pr problems come from the outside. It's, it's a very, very dangerous method. And I think these false artificial lines between global and local uh, is one of the reasons. I think if we start to accept the fact that it's the same, then we get in the right uh, direction of solving problems. And we also, by that, get away from the short-term perspective. Because, of course, if you have your next election, Gordon, you have to worry about your constituents. But this is a bit of an educational exercise, which we now have to start very drastically soon, if we are to make it. Because otherwise, we cannot sell the international solutions unless they are seen as being in the enlightened self-interest. Enlightened self-interest can not only be done on charity to do it for the outside world, it's also be done for our own security in the long term. Let me just pick up, because again, there are a lot of people who are commenting on this, like Lord Casanova. Globalization is becoming out of fashion. We need to produce global solutions which need to be seen as local. Gary Lafree, are we now in a situation similar to the one the world faced much earlier before the current dominance of nation states? And Faisan Udin, do short-term national interests override the, the international interest? Well, th this is the issue, is it, is it not? Um, around the world, young people are able to communicate globally now. We will see the growth of global pressure groups, but I think everybody is aware that national uh, interests will still be the most important way uh, that uh, opinion is reflected. And uh, if you are to have an impact, all the people here 
uh, it will best be done not simply by meeting globally, but by using the weight you have in influencing your national governments to act in a more globally responsible way. Now, I want to take the example of unemployment, which has been raised by the people who have been uh, uh, twittering uh, to us and the people who are giving their opinions. If you take what's happening to the world economy at the moment, it's pretty clear, is it not, that the scope for America to grow fast is limited by the high levels of personal debt and therefore the limitations on consumer expenditure, by the fiscal cliff and therefore the limitations on public expenditure, uh, by the inability of the uh, private investor to consider that he's got a good project as long as the consumer market remains depressed, and America is looking to export to the rest of the world. If you look at Europe, that is the position of Europe as well. To be able to grow faster, it needs to export to the rest of the world. But not everybody can export. You can't, I mean, there is no planet of Mars that we can send exports to, and not every country is going to be able to increase its trade. Uh, so we need an agreement. China has got uh, to expand its consumer expenditure. India has got to open its markets. And the West has got to be able to sell to the rest of the world, and then the consumer confidence will return in the West. That requires a global agreement. You will not get unemployment, 200 million, 80 million young people coming down fast unless you have some form of global agreement. And this is where I come back to Pascal's uh, point. There was a high point of global cooperation. It may have been uh, out of desperation. It may have been because people wanted to spend money. I don't want to get into that argument at the moment. But it is possible to resurrect that degree of global cooperation. We've got a new American uh, uh, presidency, uh, and uh, Barack Obama is in a position to look outwards in a way that perhaps he wasn't before. We've got a new Chinese leadership uh, ca ca coming in. People are beginning to see the limits of what national governments governments can do without global cooperation, and if there were effective national pressure groups, then what we proposed in 2009, which was a global growth compact that would follow the immediate action we took to deal with the recession, uh, that could actually happen. But my feeling is that unless there is a heightened level of global cooperation, and therefore it's in the interest of all nations, we will not get to the levels of growth that people expect the world economy to be capable of achieving. So you are able, in my view, to put an argument based on economic uh, principle about why global cooperation is in the interest of every nation uh, around the world. Now, gentlemen, I'm going to unashamedly discriminate now in favour of women um, from the audience with microphones as well. There are six microphones. Put up a bit of paper or something white so I can see. Uh, I'm discriminating in your favour if you're a, a woman because you are not represented either by me or by the panel, partly because um, Ine Onuk says the inclusion of women in all global government's issues needs to be re-emphasized. <laughs> Julia Bucknell, gl glad climate change and gender are on the agenda here, but they seem to be trailing in importance rather than central to it. Julia, Ine, do you want to speak further on that? There are a lot of women in the audience and almost nothing. Yes, please, over there. Would you introduce yourself as well? Hello, Dar Daria Golubiowska Tatai. Uh, well, one moment, uh, speak again. Keep, keep speaking and then we'll hear you. Daria Golubiowska Tatai, Poland. Um, thank you for raising this issue. Um, I believe that we need intermediary measures to accelerate the empowerment of women. In Europe, we talk about quotas. Um, this is opposed. Well, what other examples can we give? The global networks empower women and build their capacity to have their voices heard in the mainstream discussion. Could you advise, could you suggest what can be done to include more women into these global organizations uh, discussing and taking decisions. Now, uh, where, is, where is Julia and Inid? Would they like to come in? You have kindly sent me a message. Anyone else? Any other woman in the audience who wants to reinforce that point? Please, at the front. This is about a giant conversation. Don't sit on your hands until 3 o'clock, please, because your voice won't be heard then until you're in your groups. Okay, hello. I'm Jihada Bonafisa, a global shaper from Khartoum Hub. Uh, my question is regarding how do we balance international governance versus respecting the local boundaries and national sovereignty, especially when it comes to issues, of course, like human rights and women's rights. And of course, I'm from Sudan, originally from Darfur, so this is uh, of importance to me as a personal interest as well. Thank you. Let's pick up that point first, and then, Jan, you can pick up on that point as well. The, uh, about how to get uh, women far more involved and r recognized mm -hmm. by global governance. Pascal Lamy. 
I think it's a, it's a question of a, each of us doing what each of us believes is necessary to promote gender in our systems. My own team is a, has a large majority of women. And why is it so? Because I recruited them and I decided that's how it should be. Uh, I don't think in international organizations we should have a quota system, but we have instructions from our members. The UN system, I think, is a good example of that. If there is a short list for filling a position, uh, there needs to be an equal number of men and women which is on the short list. Now, it's not a quota system, but it's this sort of device which were also used in the in government system. So I think processes, constraints of this kind can help. Uh, it's, it's a structure that can help, but at the end of the day, it's for each of us to do and behave the way we believe we should. Well, I think there are two great challenges uh, for women. One is women's empowerment. And uh, there's a long way to go, but there's been progress. Much more has to be done. Another matter which is violence against women, which I think is horrifying and horrific, and uh, which we need to fight on all levels. Um, I, I myself have been a mediator in several conflicts. Unfortunately, I've never seen a woman on the other side of the table. And uh, therefore, I think it's very good that the Security Council of the United Nations have adopted Resolution 1325, which gives women a position in peace building and mediation. And I, I actually invited from Sudan several women to be privileged observers at the opening of the negotiations in 2007. I don't, I don't know whether you were one of those, but it's anyway great to, 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 to at least try to work in each sector. You, to talk about it in generality is one thing. You have to look at each sector and do something about it. Gordon Brown, you've just uh, come from Pakistan, yeah. where you've been meeting a lot of young women in classes after the shooting of Malala Yousafzai. Yeah, I, I, I've been in Pakistan in the last two days, and I was in Pakistan three years ago, and I notice a distinct change that the civil society organizations are being led by women, that women are not content uh, with the hierarchical organization of politics that exists at the moment in that country. And gradually you will see, as in the case of the public protests, where every girl is identifying with Malala Yousafzai, the 14-year-old who was uh, shot by the Taliban. And gradually, you see, in my view, women moving to the fore in Pakistan uh, uh, politics. Uh, I think I've just, I've just been in India, and of course, there are quarters for in, in India for women's representation. If I think of my visits to Africa, it is women, in my view, who will change Africa uh, because they will not accept, uh, in the end, the old patriarchal forms of leadership which constrain the ability of people to make the difficult decisions. So uh, I, I would uh, not rule out any measure, whether it was uh, quotas or whether it was shortlists or whether it was uh, other legal means of ensuring representation. But the one thing I would say is that the majority of children not at school are girls. And as long as we discriminate against girls and prevent them getting the basic opportunities of education, then we are failing our world and failing the prospects for the future. And I would hope that the outlawing of child labor and child marriage and these practices that discriminate against girls, which Malala Yousafzai has symbolized by her determination to go to school, is one of the first steps uh, to ensuring not only the equal representation of women, but ensuring that, in my, as in my view, it is the case, women's empowerment is going to be one of the major forces changing the world over the next 10 years. What we're trying to do, and we've got 10 minutes left, is, is shape the landscape for discussion of governance and also for all the Global Agenda Councils. Let me move forward, therefore, with two or three other important issues. Anne Mettler, the Global Agenda is being dominated by powerful vested interests and economic incumbents. Please explain how to overcome these and foster true cooperation. And building perhaps on the last series of questions, what positive role can faith and religious values play in supporting global governance? Pascal Lamy. Well, I mean, on the first question, again, my answer today is more on the side of go local. Uh, and that's my experience with trade in recent years. Take agricultural tariffs, uh, which is a major issue of disagreement in world trade negotiations. Agricultural tariffs have been going down in recent years. Why? Because prices are 
moving up, and because of prices, international prices moving up, governments want to keep the price of food low at home, so they reduce tariffs. And when they don't do that, by the way, they have demonstrations. Remember Israel last year? Huh? People in the streets because food was too high. Now, what does the government do? Lower agricultural import tariffs. They wouldn't have done that probably at the WTO, but they did it because their population were screaming in the street that you know, food was too pricey. Now, on the, second, on the second area, I don't know much about the views of uh, Muslims about global governance. Uh, I don't know a lot about the views of Buddhists about global governance. I know a bit about the Christian side of this, and there has been in the Christian faith a long-standing tradition since the middle of the 19th century of a pro-global governance stream. Uh, the Catholic Church, Rome Novarum, uh, Leon XIII, in the end of the 19th century to the present, uh, what is called the social doctrine of, of the church, has quite a lot of views about what they call a legitimate global uh, authority. So there is a part of that. I, I'm, not, mm. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. What I'm saying is that there is a culture there that goes in the direction. I've had another question uh, for both Gordon Brown and Jan Eliasson about the global agenda being dominated by powerful vested interests and economic incumbents. Well, I think um, everybody's voice uh, needs to be heard. And um, I, I, I agree with Pascal that um, this whole process now um, has to be built on from, from, from the citizens. Klaus was talking about a crisis in governance. Uh, and if there is such a crisis, and I admit the question is really very legitimate, then to, we have to make sure that we are talking about here is carried by people from the, from the grassroots, from the local communities, from at home. Otherwise, we will really have problem with that trust factor. The, the deepest issue is that when we see these enormous problems around us and we cannot deal with, the leadership cannot deal with them, then you will have a lack of trust. In other words, this process of identifying the issues has to be something that is, has, is, has ownership on so many levels. When we now start to go the road for the post-2015 development agenda, we want to have this agenda being discussed now so that not, not two or three years from now, a committee from the United Nations will point, say, this is what we have agreed. This has to be owned by the people. And, and I think by bringing in the international dimension in our local discussions, then we have a chance really to carry out the governance needed in the end with the support of the people. Gordon Brown. Well, of course, there are, there are powerful vested interests uh, wherever you look. But I think uh, what this discussion is bringing out is the power of people, if they are so minded, usually operating through their national uh, uh, constituencies to affect change. Uh, and uh, when Pascal referred to uh, religious values uh, influencing the debate on uh, global change, I think that every religion that I've ever studied or looked at or heard about has at its centre a, a golden rule about our responsibilities to other people. Uh, and no matter what controversy there is about aspects of each faith, I think uh, we can agree that this is the central concern in each of these uh, religions. There's a great story about the uh, breakdown after the Second World War in Europe, where Albert Camus, the writer, Jean-Paul Sartre, the writer, Stephen de Beauvoir, the women's writer, Andrew Mulroe, the cultural minister, they met together and Camus said to them, didn't we get it all wrong? when we said that there was no such thing as ethical values. Shouldn't we admit that there is such a thing as moral values? And if we did so, that would be the beginning of hope. And I feel that after the financial crisis, the same thing should be said amongst all of us. If we underpin our institutions, and there's a Global Agenda Council on Ethics, I know, if we underpin our institutions by clear ethical foundations, then we are in a far stronger position to look at the value that is created by finance, by industry, by commerce, and of course it will, in my view, lead to a conclusion that our interdependence 
requires us to act far more constructively together than we have done in, in the past. Global problems, in my view, require global solutions, and that's the message I've taken out of the last few years. Let me get one more question from the floor, please. Uh, I'm Saskia Sassen. Back to women. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that shows that women are far more likely to construct networks, poor migrant women, rich corporate women, sort of men have clubs, women have networks. That's a bit exaggerated, admittedly. Uh, my question is, doesn't this whole infrastructure of networks that women have in some very remote places of the world also, and in some very central core places of the world, doesn't that suggest that it should be easy to engage women? I really liked what the representative of the United Nations said, John Eliasson. I, it seems to me there is an infrastructure to connect women at all levels, through all places, to the variety of issues that we confront. All right, gentlemen, do you agree that women are better at networks? Yeah. <laughs> well, the World Economic Forum is a competitor. Uh, I think this is a bigger point, yeah. actually. Uh, uh, it's about the whole uh, approach to management and governance. The old systems of command and control have been proved to be wanting. To some extent, they're identified with male yeah. hierarchies and male patriarchy. Good point. And the new systems are networks based on collaboration, uh, uh, cooperation, uh, and of course, uh, coordination. And I think that's, in a sense, what we're talking about through all our discussions uh, yeah. about the future of technology and the future of industry, as well as the future of government. So I think the point is, is well taken, and I, I think I agree with it entirely about the role that women play in networking and the effect of that but it raises a, a wider point about how we govern ourselves in the future. Yeah. Well, I was once working for a prime minister called Olof Palme, and uh, we speechwriters wrote uh, as a rubric uh, the, the, the importance of emancipation of women. And then he said, you are wrong. This subject is actually about something else. It's about emancipation of man. In other words, uh, you sh it's good that you have the, the networks now, but you should realize that you have a great potential in the other 50% of humanity realizing that it is in the enlightened self-interest to make sure that your resources are utilized the way historically you, it has not been. We're coming to the end, but I hope what we're doing is giving you a springboard. I can see one hand going up, but what I want to do is bring together three or four more messages, if I may, for the last intervention before, I'm, sadly, we have to close for the councils. Um, Aaron Kramer, what does failure of the Eurozone to manage regional issues tell us about the nature currently of governance or the failings of governance? And building on that, uh, number 77 from Eron Bloomgarten. Do we have the global institutions we need, or do we need new ones? And finally, 78, Robin Niblett from Chatham House in London. Pascal Lamy says that leadership for global governance is unlikely because leaders are focused on dealing with the financial crisis, unemployment, low growth. But what about leadership from the parts of the world where there is growth, where there is employment, and relative st financial stability? No hope? Or would the West rather continue to monopolize leadership on governance? Your final thoughts, please. Pascal Lamy. I think that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, it's true that the crisis is now today hurting more with Western rich countries, uh, US, EU, Japan, and the like, uh, than emerging countries. But it is also true that because emerging countries are emerging, the number of domestic challenges they have to face in pure political terms is extremely high. Uh, and the best example of that, as we all know, is China. Uh, but you know, India, South Africa, Mexico, Brazil are countries where the speed of economic change has yet to be matched by a proper speed of social governance, political change. So my simple answer to that would be emerging countries, the ones that are in extremely rapid transformational phases, also need a lot of political energy at home mm. to keep things going. Mm. Huh? Law and order, just as an example, corruption, another. 
regional imbalances, social imbalances, inequalities. So this needs a lot of governance. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't compare them to, you know, again, US, EU, Japan. They have their own challenges. And I don't think for the moment they are ready to take the sort of international leadership uh, which uh, US, uh, Europe, uh, or <coughs> other developed countries did take in, uh, in some areas. I think it yeah, will be there for the future. For the moment, yeah. I wouldn't bet on that. I respond to the question about whether we need uh, new global institutions. I think we have the global institutions that could be used much better. We have, of course, the United Nations, we have the World Bank, the Bretton Woods Institution, and by the way, let me tell you that the new mood of cooperation between the World Bank and the United Nations is something uniquely new. Jim Kim, the new leader of uh, the World Bank and Ban Ki-moon, uh, have agreed on a set of projects which would really bring the Bretton Woods institutions much closer to the UN. It's a great step forward. We need to work with the regional organizations. We need to work with the private sector, with academic life, with civil society. Reach out, be catalytic. I think we should, in the future, think and work much more horizontally and less vertically. We should be good in what we do vertically, but we will only be useful. We only will deal with issues in an in a, in a, in a effective way if we work across each other. And here I think this formula, there is no peace without development. And there is no development without peace. And there is none of the above without respect of human rights and rule of law. Shows that we need to take away the borderlines between political, economic, and human rights. We need to see that as a, as a whole and work with them at the same time. Because if one of these sectors, is, uh, pillars, is weak, the whole structure is weak. So, yes, use the present institutions, but break down walls between them. Then I think we could make a real difference and make sure we have the local perspective. Gordon Brown, your final thought, please, quickly. A lot of these questions are about what we can't do, and I would like you to think in your agenda councils about what you can do. Don't use the weakness of the euro or its difficulties as an argument against international cooperation. The argument for international cooperation will grow over the next few years. Don't use the weakness or uh, mistakes that are made by individual institutions or politicians in the last few years as an argument against the need that we have got to cooperate more globally in the years uh, to come. Think of how we can strengthen the institutions. And equally at the same time, think how you can be pressure groups within your own country as stakeholders uh, for asking your national governments to play a far bigger role in the global community. If we believe that these are global problems that require global solutions, then that must be the way that we've got to move to persuade people that they've got to take the action that is necessary. And I've learned one final thing, that the next panel uh, cannot be three men. <laughs> <laughs>Some of you are probably frustrated. I've tried to get as many of your views into the mix as possible. There are others as well, and I conclude with one suggestion from J. Baudouin. If only Apple could release an iGovernance app. <laughs> if there's anyone from Apple here, please tell us if you're going to do it. Now, let me introduce you to Martina Gnoor, who's going to tell us about uh, how the Global Agenda Councils are going to function. And can I thank Gordon Brown, Jan Eliasson, and Pascal Lamy. I would like to thank the panel for this perfect context for the next session where we'll ask you to meet with your council and provide your energies and brain power to really think of and develop new ideas and recommendations to address some of the challenges we just discussed and um, shape a better future for the next generations. Thank you.